It seems every few years we hit a bottleneck, whether it's battery life or whether it's the amount of memory available for cameras, processing power available for cameras. Um, it seems to me that one of the biggest potentials for light field imaging is actually not stills, it's video. Because you know, if you tell a photographer, oh, you can focus after the event, that takes a while for them to, to lock in. But if you tell a filmmaker, you can focus pull after the event, and straight away you've got them because focus pulling is one of the most difficult things to do as a filmmaker. Yeah. Right. I mean, how, presumably, is it only computational power that's st stopping you from doing that right now? Because that must be a vast amount of data. Um, literally, yes. Right. <laughs> so that's the answer. The simple answer, yes, it's computation power. The theory for stills and the theory for motion is the same, right? It's a, it's a rapid succession of images. Um, creating an experience that understands the scene and reacts to the scene at 30, 60, 120 frames per second is an incredible, the resolution, to, to capture light field at 4K resolution, it is an incredible scientific achievement. <laughs> and we are working with the top companies out there to figure out how to make that happen. So we're definitely uh, interested in delivering that experience in the best way possible. And the more we dig into it, the more we discover value. So the value, the obvious one, well, you can focus after the fact. Great. You can set aperture. That's great. You can create virtual cameras within your camera. You can create new ways to image stabilize. You can, you can analyze the scene because we have the three-dimensional information at 120 frames per second. The number of things that we can do, we can start dealing with, with the information in depth. We can separate the background from the image. We can relight the scene. The number of things that you can do suddenly by merging computer graphics with photography is just astounding. So Jay, let's, let's keep you on, on the subject of processing power and <laughs> data for a minute, which is boringly fascinating. Um, <laughs> Samsung is what we call a vertically integrated company in the sense that you make pretty much everything that goes into everything. You sure. make all the components yep. you make. I mean, how much does the sheer, the sheer processing requirement of things like 4K and of the incredible fast frame rates you've got in something like the NX1, I mean, how much does that rely on you having the processors to keep up? You know, what comes first? Um, well, right now it's not sensors. I mean, the, the, the NX1 sensor for some of the applications in the camera will actually, you can, it, it, it clocks all 28 megapixels, 240 frames per second. Right, and that's to achieve the focusing? Um, focusing, the some of the smart uh, uh, auto shot functions we have. So 240 frames at 28 megapixels is like, six gazillion um, megapixels a second. We'll go with that. Um, the, but the, the back end, in terms of finding use for that, uh, is tied a lot to kind of industry standard architectures. So creating JPEGs, moving into 4K. Uh, 4K provides an, an industry standard for, for how to deal with 30, 60 frames per second, which is convenient, and then gives us a path to pull stills if we want as well. But, but the processing power, um, is a little bit different in the, historically in, in camera architectures. For years, uh, camera manufacturers took uh, microcontrollers and put an operating system on them and tried to run cameras that way, and that limited performance until, uh, let's say, 10 years ago when people started doing application-specific camera processors, which were designed to ASICs, ASICs with, with uh, JPEG engines built in and data paths built in that were optimized for cameras. They weren't taking basically computer chips, computer processors, and putting them in a camera and, and running over them. We were, we were, we were building them specific, specifically for cameras. Uh, in, the, in the last few generations from most manufacturers, uh, there have been great jumps in processing power. This one has, has five cores in it, in the, in the processor. It's got five IPUs in it. Um, uh, and it can take that data, the 240 frames per second, and use it for all kinds of things, for autofocus, for motion tracking, and all of that. So the computing power is growing. Um, the sensors aren't, aren't an issue anymore. It's a matter of marrying those to the back-end needs of the photographers. Mm -hmm. If there was an application we could find where someone... Where, where, where we could get money for it, where we could use all that power, we'd, we'd obviously, you know, the market would, would develop the back-end computing power to drive it. Um, and, and it's heading that way. Uh, Does Moore's law still apply? Is it still every, every year capacity doubles and price halves or whatever that is? Um, Moore's law never applied to, hasn't applied to processing power in cameras in uh, 
the last 10 years since we moved to ASICs. It's actually been slower. It was slower at the beginning. Now it's, it's actually moving faster because we're able to adopt a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the cool semiconductor tricks that have been out there that the camera manufacturers haven't, haven't been, didn't use initially in our ASIC designs. So a lot of the, the mobile cores that, are, uh, that, are, uh, that have been used in phones, that have been used in mobile computing platforms are now rolling into cameras. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually moving faster than Moore's Law right now for the last year or so, which is gonna drive tremendous um, technology boosts in the cameras. Just the jump in 4K, the processing power that people are rolling in for 4K across the industry is 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 a, a much is is much more accelerated than the than the kind of linear Moore's law piece. That's interesting. And yeah. One of the things I mean, we used when we were at Photokina recently, we'll do a, a sort of a highlight reel from Photokina during tomorrow's um, sessions. But when I was at Photokina, I used the the Red Epic Dragon, the new I think, 6K, I think it is. I mean, that thing has a fan built into the back of it, and it gets hot. And it's not just processing power, is it? It's not just the bottleneck of moving all that data. There's, there's heat, there's thermal issues to consider too. I mean, Matt, how do you, how do you deal with that in a camera like the, the GH4, which still has to be small and can't have a fan built into it? Well, it's, <laughs> let's be clear about the Epic Dragon. I mean, first off, that's a product that can shoot 240 frames per second 4K video. Um, I, I don't... I don't know your product well enough, but I'm almost certain it does not do 240 <laughs> frames per second 4K. So we'll save it. yeah, it's a it's a very very different beast, mm -hmm. and it's an application specific camera. Uh, as we were talking about ASICs earlier, uh, realistically with Panasonic, it's it's a pretty simple process. We we design our own engines. So the Venus engine uh, version nine is what added the encoding for um, 4K video in the different codecs that we support. But then it's also how do you get the heat away? So some companies are concentrated on stability of their sensors and making sure they can stabilize the sensor. Our primary concern is making sure we can wick enough heat away from the sensor so we can push it harder. So you know, we can't really at this point, doesn't mean in the future we won't be able to, but at this point, we just can't make an in-body image stabilized sensor and get enough heat wicked away. So the sensor, in effect, is coupled to the chassis of the camera. And the camera is made of magnesium alloy, so we dissipate the heat into the atmosphere and get it away from the sensor. I mean, so you've got one of the biggest heat... heat right, the whole right. camera's a heat sink in the GH4. And you'll find that, I think, in pretty much every magnesium camera design. Right. Yeah. But, 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 but I think it's also important to note that we designed the sensor from the ground up because it's a, it, it is a live view, full-time live view, mirrorless camera design. We designed the sensor from the ground up to be used you know, 120, 240 times per second. You know, our sensor output technically, I think, is 481. It, it's irrelevant. It, at 240 times a second for the autofocus system, we knew that that sensor was going to heat up. So, you know, we had designed the sensor to be able to withstand that. So, whether it's the the metallurgy of the CMOS that we put into the product and, and how it will handle heat dissipation at, at not heat dissipation, but how it handles the heat and produces noise as it heats up, had to be fundamentally different. You know, when you're, when you're dealing with an SLR camera, their primary focus with the sensor is to capture photo and to capture a single frame. So. There's a lot of challenges in their design because they've done so much downsizing around the sensor in order to just get the body small enough to work with that once you take that full frame sensor and take it into account and you haven't engineered it to be a live view sensor to begin with, you run into challenges with heat dissipation. That's why so many of them warn in the manuals, hey, you know, you only do this many minutes of video before you, we're going to shut you down. So both Panasonic and Samsung, I guess, from your point of view, you have an advantage from using sub full frame sensors in that regard. Um, Do you think? I think so, absolutely. I'm going to say yes, but, but I mean, most people think the sensor is what generates most of the heat mm -hmm. in most of the camera designs, but, but it's not, not the case. The, historically, it's been the clock drivers. It's been the analog electronics that are clocking out the sensor that oftentimes are separate from the, or historically have been separate from the chip themselves. Right. And those were old, 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 old electronics for, uh, that are still used, that are still used mm -hmm. by some manufacturers. <laughs> Um, uh, and, but those generate mostly, and they're and they're so close to the sensor that most people think it's the sensor that's generating all all that heat. And the sensor does generate heat, uh, or can generate a lot of heat. But but there've been huge improvements in in and developments in in the analog electronics that that are that are in the sensors and the integration of analog right on the sensor that have, that have cut uh, heat uh, by orders of magnitude um, per, per, per flushing on the, on the sensors. Um, as well, you know, the, the, the DSPs or the ASICs that are in there, those used to generate a lot of heat. Um, as everyone's moved to better design rules, 
uh, rolled in mobile cores, all this stuff, um, they generate much less heat and they use a lot less power. The less power you're using through the whole system, uh, the, the less heat mm -hmm. is trapped in the system to dissipate. So there've been fairly significant, massive, massive improvements in, uh, in, in power that, that, that come back to much less heat in the system to begin with. Now, I will say, sorry, I think we have a question from the... Yeah. From the I'm going to throw this question, you know, just out to you guys, because we were talking about heat, we're talking about 4K. Um, what is the next big technical challenge that camera makers must overcome? All right, well, let's start with, uh, I guess, let's start with Ariel, actually. I think that Lightroom's challenges will be very different than um, other companies, because we're trying to figure out how to capture entire scene to the degree, to the fidelity that we think photographers are interested in. Um, in light of photography, part of the challenge is the fact that you need a lot of data to create that scene because it's not the actual focused image, it is just the rays of light that you render from. So the more data you have, the higher quality the rendering. And um, we have two main challenges. One is capturing enough quality data and the other one is processing a lot of data. Um, and that comes back to everything we talked about, heat. Battery, uh, everything we talk. So we do share challenges, but I think because of our because of our approach is to render the scene, we have less concerns about getting the focus right. Right. Every camera, even a light field camera, has a refocusable range, but it's a broad range. So we can move it around and give full creativity to the photographer. Uh, but we don't really have to get that shot just right at time of click, where um, in a traditional uh, camera you do. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I think this is an interesting time to bring up what, uh, what your former CEO used to, used to talk about in terms of Moore's Law and uh, rent, um, yeah. and uh, what happens if you extrapolate a 1.1 micron size pixel to a full frame sensor, it becomes like a 500 to 800 megapixel sensor. Um, you don't really need that much spatial resolution for an image. At that point, you can really think about larger sensors with high pixel densities where you actually capture the light field and still have a high resolution image. That is a lot of data. That right? is a lot of data. So, so think, of, think of the curve. Our first generation camera used a, basically a 10, 11 mega ray. This one, 40. We're committing to 4Xing the resolution of our camera generation after generation. And you can imagine where the roadmap we're working on is heading to. There is nobody in the industry that is even attempting, there's no reason to create a billion yeah. mega ray sensor. There's just simply no reason to. We have a reason to. Right. We're exceeding NASA in that research in terms of what do you need to capture. So back on Earth, Matt, what's the biggest challenge to, uh, to Panasonic from your point of view? Maybe a little less lofty. <laughs> um, so I, I guess there's a, a few challenges. I think the primary challenge from uh, photography and cinematography perspective uh, frankly, is getting higher frame rates out of the cameras. Uh, there's a, there's certainly a demand and an interest in shooting at higher, higher than 30 frames or higher than 60 frames, uh, both from a photographer's perspective in that they're able to extract more frames and get you know better burst functionality, but to be able to do slow mo functions, you know, obviously. If, if you're watching this on the internet, you've probably watched the MythBusters at least once or twice in your life, and you love to see those super slow mos. And so for us, I think. That's probably our biggest challenge: is managing to get frame rates faster in the product. And what's the bottleneck there? Well, there's a whole slew of bottlenecks, really. <laughs> whether it's whether it's the the amount of um, buffer that you can build into the product, how you dissipate heat from within the camera, mm -hmm. whether or not the sensor is capable of doing a full readout um, of the entire sensor, all pixels, you know, 480, 960 right. times a second. Um, fans that people like Red are, are allowed to put into their products that we're not able to because <laughs> it's totally different application for that product. You know, we kind of have to be a jack of all trades and master of most with a product like this. And so we just simply can't put a lot of fans or yeah. heat dissipation equipment in the product. And Jay, from your perspective? I think it's going to be customization. I mean, the, the sensor technologies are, are proven to the point where we can get whatever we invest in out the other end. Mm -hmm. um, computing power-wise, uh, there's more combined computing power in these cameras than, than most computer stores have in them today in terms of computers. Uh, but figuring out what to do with it. and uh, We can clock the sensors at 240 frames per second. We can, um, 
theoretically put enough computing power in there to, to suck that down and, and store it. Um, but we need, to, we need applications for the technology that makes sense and that, that customers are going to use in order to, to drive the technology. Um, there, there's customers out there asking for 60 frame UHD from all of us, uh, or 60 frame 4K and 124K and all of that. And it's, it's, it's doable. It's a matter of doing it in a way that's economically feasible in an architecture that's, that's executable on the back end. Um, as we do that, there's a lot of other things that need to fall into place with 4K in terms of editing tools and data management. And uh, those were the same problems that were there for full HD. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people thought they were insurmountable until they, they rapidly, the market came in and, and, and solved those problems. Well, data seems to me to have been the most consistent bottleneck over the past decade of design, just dealing with more and more and more information every generation. And some of that's being addressed. I mean, new codecs are, are doing that. Um, the shift from H.264 to H.265 for, for broadcast, um, as that rolls into capture devices, you'll see you know, you're, you're having the amount of, having the required data rate because you have a more efficient codec. Codecs will continue to progress. But as we're uh, touching into kind of consumer standards like, like the codecs, um, it slows us down a little bit from a design standpoint because they have to be ratified by, by big committees of engineers and corporations and all of that. Um, so we, we can look for alternate solutions. But, uh, uh, yeah. Well, and I think on the codec side, um, going to a more advanced codec is clearly going to tax the engine far greater because you're talking about what we, we, what we refer to as a long GOP or a large group of pictures. Sorry, there's your definition out there. Group of pictures is what GOP stands for. Yeah, the, the larger the... The more efficient the codec, the larger the number of frames that have to be captured and processed so we know we're going to use blue pixel number 1.1 in frame 60 from frame 2. The more of those frames that you're working with, the more taxing it is for processing power. So it, it's also a counterbalance of making sure that when you put a codec into a product that it not only works within the camera, that it works within the ecosystem of, of what people are going to be using it for in the future. So when they bring it out of the camera, are they going to be able to work with it in post? Sometimes you can save yourself some processing data by going to a, a legacy codec and maybe it takes a minute, it gives you a minute per gig of recording time versus you know, two or four minutes of gig. But when you bring it in to bring it, to edit and post, yeah, sorry, yes, gig of, sorry. Yes. One minute per gigabit, gigabyte of data. So when we do that, it allows us to then make sure it will work within the current ecosystem that's at play. So it, it, there's a lot of challenges that both companies have to deal with when we're designing things. And how future, for, how future forward are we willing to be with our design versus making certain it's going to work today? Jay brought up an interesting point um, regarding customization. And uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of people will say that companies are sort of conservative in terms of opening up their cameras um, in terms of customizability and apps and things like that. Whereas on, on cell phones, for example, we're seeing you know, a, a pretty open architecture where people can develop apps. Um, is there any interest at your company's um, this whole idea of uh, open source photography or open source cameras, especially in light of the new... Um, was it a Kickstarter or some project, the Axiom, um, is trying to do 4K video? With, uh, I'm sure you've heard of it. But, yeah, in terms of um, opening up your cameras to, in crowdsource creativity and app development, even control. This conversation that we're about to have. <laughs> about what we're about to do. Uh, you give a quick um, background to Magic Lantern. Rishi, you're probably best qualified. Uh, well, Magic Lantern, but they're, they're actually just, uh, I think they're just involved with the project, right? They, they, uh, they pretty much hacked Canon cameras to... Uh, operate in ways that previously, you know, they were not... Do things that never intended to do. Yeah, and it's been emer amazing, the emergent properties from that. So uh, I, I would love to see what happens when you, when you open this stuff up. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to jump in with another question, if that's cool. Mm -hmm. sure. Go ahead. So um, great question from out there. So what is going to have a bigger impact on photography, the hardware or the software that runs the hardware? This is related to yeah. what I was asking. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you guys know me, you've heard me pile on the, the open OS, um, open platform uh, discussions as a big advocate of that. We've rolled out open OS cameras and they've been received by developers and the market very well, you know, our Galaxy cameras and all that. Um, we, we actually released uh, our firmware open source for several generations of the NX line uh, about a year and a half ago. We've had some really interesting uh, uh, developments pop up out of that. It's from my perspective. It's very it's very interesting to see what the market does with this stuff. They're going to find applications for our cameras 
um, that we've never thought of. And the more we open up uh, the capabilities for developers and, and, and end users who are, who are capable of, of handling that stuff, I think the more it's gonna, it's gonna help cameras and photography and in, in general. And I think that's, that's gonna be uh, even more the case as we roll out 4K video. People are gonna find new applications and new things they can do with those, with that, with those higher frame rates that, that none of us have any idea of today. Um, so at Panasonic, we typically do not allow an open source for our, for our cameras. Um, that doesn't mean people haven't hacked them and turned them into things that were much greater than we intended them to be in the case of the GH2. Uh, we've begun to more closely work within partnerships and look for companies that have interesting applications that would make sense for us to open architecture up to and allow them to create for us. So in the case of uh, Promote Control, we've worked directly with them to develop a USB tether solution that they're building the software for, they're selling the software for it. Um, it's, their, it's within their purview to, to build it, but they work with our engineers um, and help with sorting out challenges. Um, we've also- you focus on the hardware. And the, you just buy the software from the person that does it best. Correct, and I, and I think the question of um, why a company won't open their, their, you know, IP, their, their IP is pretty simple. Sometimes you have to ask, what is the LSI really capable of? And what has the manufacturer chosen? LSI? Sorry, large scale integrated circuit. <laughs> there will be a test at the end Could of this. I guess that one. <laughs> okay, so there's a question of what is that device capable of? And what has the manufacturer chosen to activate within the LSI? So oft oftentimes, a single LSI will be used across multiple cameras going all the way up to the to the peak of their, of their product mix. And if you use that same LSI in the entry level, well, if you open up, the, if you open up the, the software license, all of a sudden people begin to turn functionality on that they didn't want in that product. And this is well, often- not necessarily handle for uh, uh, reasons. Or other reasons that we won't talk about. But the, the point being is that they're, sometimes they're not open because we don't want people turning things on that weren't intended to be turned on in the product and were designed for a much more expensive product. And so when an LSI is designed to be used in multiple platforms of product, sometimes people will venture beyond what the, what the total product yeah. is capable of. Because I know I heard, I mean, there was a lot of rumors when, the one, when Canon, so this is a related tangent, but when Canon released the 1DX, there were a lot of people saying you could hack it to do 4K video like the 1DC. Of course you can, the 1DC is designed to be one great big heat sink so if you did hack the 1DX, the thing would melt from the inside out within a, <laughs> within a, uh, a, few, a few moments. I mean, that's an example of someone turning something on, which the camera just can't. But you shouldn't do that. The camera can't handle it. Correct. And so I think if we're going to allow access to our command language, our software, I think it has to be within partnership. And it has to have a close understanding of what the engineer's intent was when they designed the product and communication with those engineers to make sure that we don't thermal somebody's camera on them. So you know, I so I know that people um, back in uh, Mountain View in the office asking themselves, what is he going to say about this? Because we, uh, you know, I've I've restrained myself from actually making, you know, stay tuned about Lightroom does have a very strong position about be, being a platform and allowing people to build applications. So I will not dive too much into this, but I do want to say that um, we have in this panel representation of only half of the equation. One would argue that Adobe and Apple, with Aperture and Photoshop and Lightroom, contributed equally to the progression of photography over the last 10 years than camera companies. Right? If, you spend, if, you, if you think of how much time does a professional photographer spend with a camera versus in front of a computer? Yeah. Well, if you measure based on that, then we represent probably 30% of that time. Right? So um, that is definitely something that we take into account because we are trying to fill both sides of the equation. Um, probably because we have to, because there's nobody who understand light field and how to render scenes, but we definitely think that the potential of this device is to be the raw capture device. And the rest of the experience goes to where you have more time, you're in the perfect condition to figure out exactly what image, what composition, what editing you want to have. And when you start thinking about editing based on depth, it is remarkable, it, it is an adjustment. But when you start thinking about how you edit based on depth. Back to the original question. I mean, for you, for Lytra, then presumably, it's the software is as much, if not more, of a challenge than the hardware in terms of, because you have to lead someone through a very unfamiliar process. 
You create the software in-house, you develop it in-house? Yes, we are trying to chew a lot, yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, and we demand a lot of ourselves, so um, it puts us in a, you know, in, in this position where we never feel that it's exactly right, and there's so much more that we want it to be. But yes, we're challenged with building the technology, building the camera, building the processing, sometimes building our own sensors, building our own optics, and then the software, and then the cloud services behind it. So we're trying to do a lot, and uh, we have a very dedicated, talented team that are just so passionate about photography and reinventing it. That you brought up an interesting point, which is, is you know, this is just the raw capture device, yeah. and, and then there's all this stuff that comes out of it. So um, bringing this back to something a little broader then, um, I'd love to ask all of you, um, what do you think the whole field of uh, well, technologies and computational photography really um, will bring to photographers? Because this, this ends up being that device that can just capture the world and then you can extract what you want from it in a, in a slower, more creative manner possibly. Um, what do you think we're going to see change in the next five to ten years? Well, I think that people don't understand how much computational photography is already here, right? Uh, sensors are just raw, random, not random, well-organized, but seemingly random collection of pixels that then being interpolated into, through math mathematics, which each company has its own algorithm and, and unique IP around that, um, for, to form an image. Um, I think computational photography is pushed to the nth degree at Hollywood, right, where what they shoot they already take into account all the post-processing they're going to have plans for exactly where it's going to be special effect and what we rendered on computer and what's shot on scene. That's where it's heading to, right? The, the authenticity of photography, it's a little bit like the authenticity of vinyl in the music industry. Sure, it's just sort of archaic after a while. It's become nostalgic, but authenticity doesn't matter anymore. It's what you as an artist want to do. That's what matters. In your wildest dreams, Ariel, just to stay with Lightro for, for a minute, and you're trying to change something, you're trying to, I mean, to bring back to the topic of this discussion, which is changing the definition of photography. I mean, Lightro, of any company in the world right now, is, is literally doing that. It's going from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional medium, but not just stereo imaging. I mean, right. fundamentally three-dimensional. And in your wildest dreams, do you think, at what point do you think what you're doing will become the standard for photography? That is a question I ask myself on a daily basis. Um, what is the point in which somebody will pick up this camera and pick up this camera and say, I don't know what to choose. And then after that, no, I know what to choose. I just want this one. Um, right now we recognize that we are not the first camera for professional photographer uh, for many reasons. Um, and we are figuring out item after item, what would it take? to um, really change the way photographers think about the advantages and the flexibility. Um, we are all subject to 150 years of education about what is photography, right? These cameras, including ours, by the way, are um, filled with things that evolved through obstacles of photography. Just the, even the f-stop, the concept of f-stop versus just saying, what kind of pictures do I want? What do I want in focus? What I don't want in focus, and that's it. So the, the, the thinking, and that includes also our own team, right? We're all photographers. We're all passionate about this. We're all subject to this education. So breaking new grounds and thinking what's relevant to what the composition and the art is versus what is the technique and subject of 100 years or 150 years of education is really tough. Getting to the point where you stop looking at the dials and start looking at what is the art that you're trying to create, or it doesn't have to be art, it can be um, um, the application that you're trying to apply photography to, is really tough. And we know that we have um, obstacles around the fact that this has a built-in lens. We know there are obstacles around flash photography. We know there are obstacles around many things, and we're going to get there. Eventually, it's a question about when you look at the final, ima final image and you look at what you can edit with it, it would tip the scale within the next few years to the point that it, this will be the obvious choice. That is my personal belief. I didn't mean to put you guys on the spot, but I, 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 I'm not going to put a scale, but I really think that we're going to get fairly quickly to a tipping point where this becomes vinyl. 
Well, it's interesting because you do have a lot of, like you said, 100, 150 years. You know, people have you know, workflows, ideas in their head about stuff, and, and sometimes changing those is, is very difficult. And sometimes it's, there's also a valid point to, you know, people will say, well, I shot with slide film and it had like some six stops of dynamic range, and I worked around it and I got good stuff. You know, sometimes those limitations even inspire creativity. I'm, I'm of the uh, you know, opinion of this being a, a, a raw capture device and, and save as much as you can for later because then it allows you to focus on the moment. But, um, you know, it, it's an interesting point to bring up that uh, you do have to change the mindset of a lot of people. I, the way I shoot now, I, I worry about ex- even exposure sometimes later because these cameras are such, um, the sensors are so noise free. Uh, but it, it, it takes a while to move um, the whole thought process, the processing yeah. forward to, to use cameras in new and in innovative ways and in ways that weren't thought of when you originally designed the product. Yeah, it, it's tough. I, I have to say that we, we really care about how people perceive the product. We really care about how they use it, what do they enjoy, what they don't enjoy. We know that we have challenges, we know that the processing time is too long, all these things, we are actively working to figure these things out to the point that it is seamless, where you no longer have to think of it as a challenge, and you think now, wow, look at all the advantages rather than all the challenges to get there. So we're also talking about, just moving into the last few minutes now, we're talking about light field technology and 4K video and 6K video and how it changes, uh, it sort of blurs the lines, the traditional lines that divided uh, still and video capture, and also what being in or out of focus means. And pulling it back to video, um, just for a minute, Jay and, and, and Matt, starting with, with Matt, I mean, at what point do you think we will stop thinking about video, or what point do you think the consumer will stop thinking about video cameras and still cameras as being distinct? Because we're getting there, aren't we? I don't think we are. Really? And I, I don't know that you'll ever be there. Um, there are certain things that the gentlemen who are filming us right now need in the product that they're working with that we simply can't put into a product of this size, whether it's XLR audio terminals, whether it's um, the ability to output SDI so you can use an external switching system and not have to worry about losing a dropout. Sorry, SDI is serial digital interface. <laughs> it's a cable that we use in case of in place of an HDMI cable. So do I need to explain that one? It's high definition multimedia interface. Okay. So as we get your acronym, <laughs> yes, it. I, I've been doing this a while. So the point is I don't think you're ever gonna be there. Um, but at the consumer level to the mid-level professional, to be honest with you, we're probably there right now. Mm-hmm. And the, the average consumer who shoots with a GH4 or shoots an FC1000 is going to get almost the exact same functionality that they would get from a $1,000 camcorder today. And Jay, you, you're nodding ahead. Do you agree? Um, I'm going to disagree and agree. On the consumer side, we're there. I mean, most of the video that's shot today is shot on things that aren't video cameras. Um, the vast, vast majority of it. The video camera market has essentially collapsed in the consumer space because everyone's got something that shoots video. Mm -hmm. You've got phones that shoot 4K video. Um, On the pro side, I think all those technology hurdles we see today will be solved just like they've been solved in every other piece, whether um, the need for a port gets gets, uh, moved past by a new port standard or um, 802.11ac or uh, some, some other technology uh, transformation that'll drive it. Um, physical microphone connections are, are going to go away someday, um, whether it's 14 months from now or um, when my Star Trek communicator works better. Um, whatever core technology they use in the communicator, I mean, that was kind of a joke. Because uh, okay, I'll stop now. But uh, I think on the pro side, the the same convergence that we've seen on the consumer side and the advanced amateur side um, will continue. And I don't think you're going to see uh, uh, cameras that are just video cameras in five years. You're going to see devices that may not look like these, but, but they're going to be the same device people are using for stills and, and video because that's, that's, that's how the market's moved. Um, so much video production's already moved onto, onto removable lens platforms that aren't uh, mm-hmm. video cameras. Uh, that's, that's the predominant, those are the predominant platforms in the market now. That's going to continue and continue and continue. So in the final couple of minutes, interesting times ahead for everyone, I think. I just want to ask everyone on the panel, including you, Rishi, as well, when, what makes you say, wow, now? I mean, we've all been in the industry for, for a little while. You know, we're hard to surprise and we're harder to impress. What was the last time you, Jay, said, wow, about anything, your product or someone else's? Um, I, I hate to say it, but with this thing, when I picked it up the, the first time two months ago, and it did the the 15 frame per second thing. Because I used to work as a, as a photographer, and 15 frames a second is just sick 
for 28 megapixels. And the, the crazy high frame rates we can get off these, 4K video, uh, the stuff that's in the, the, the cameras that are, that are rolling out this year, as a photographer, or now sold out former photographer, gone corporate, um, all this technology is just amazing. me. And, and uh, there's more stuff in these cameras that's rolling out now than I ever could have imagined ever being possible in, in, in cameras. Um, it's, a, it's a great time to be a photographer. Matt? So the thing that made me say wow and won't be Panasonic related. Um, when I was at the NAB show and I saw 8K video at, a video at 100, a yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a video show, and I saw 8K video at 120 frames per second on a screen that is about 400, you know, 400 inches, and I realized sports photography is going to change radically when we can shoot 33 megapixel video frames at up to 120 frames per second. That's a wow moment, and that's, that's what really, I think, if you're forward-looking, that's where we're going. Because that's already, I mean, in, in Japan, the, some things are being broadcast in 8K No, already. no, no, NH, NHK is working. I'm sorry, I don't know what NHK stands for because it's three Japanese that's words. That's all right. But that's the broadcast equivalent of the BBC from mm -hmm. your homeland, I'm assuming. My home planet. Yes. So um, they're working on the standards for it now. Right. Um, Panasonic has made a commitment that by the Jap the, the Olympics, in, I think it's 2020 for Japan, that we'll have a camera ready for that. So you'll have broadcast around 2020. Ariel? So for me, what makes me go wow is creativity. And I think creativity can be on the engineering side, but also on the artistry of photography, right? And that's why I think this is the best industry in the world. It just it merges between these two creative forms of creativity. Creative forms of creativity. That is not a well-formed sentence. I apologize. Uh, but I understand. <laughs> you get my drift. So I, I think that, yes, I, I, I'm... I'm I'm a techno geek myself. I love everything that is about what makes it work. But seeing what people create with these cameras is astounding. And, and, and it's not just with the cameras, right? Remember, it's also what they do with their computers using it. And what you see, what comes off the other side is just amazing. That like goes and goes well. Yeah, and Rishi? That's a, that's a great one. It's just what you see when you see someone create a beautiful movie with, with, even with film. I mean, it's the, the, the creative element is amazing. From a technological standpoint, I'm, I'm wide about a lot of things, probably. <laughs> I was getting excited in the office, so I, I'm not going to go through them all here. But um, a few things that I have wowed me recently is, um, um, this is Ledger's here, uh, it, you know, opening up the Ledger software, taking one of my files of, of some family member I shot, and then just dragging around the perspective and seeing the perspective shift, and the image come alive, taking that aperture slider and dialing it from F1 to F16, it opens up creativity. It's just this, this new parameter I can adjust. Um, when I was uh, at, uh, at one of the conferences checking out what you can do with light field displays, where it's just not even an active technology, but you can, you can look around stuff, and, and the perspective automatically shifts, one day pairing that with Lytro. Um, what I can do with RAW files recently, I love landscapes. I, I don't even need graduated ND filters anymore with the D810. It's um, the thing I can get with, with autofocus systems that have been developed over years, um, actually using traditional PDF systems. It's uh, there's no excuse anymore for, for bad photography. <laughs> it's, it's amazing things you can do with, with cameras. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> it's been a really interesting discussion, I think. Thank you um, to my co-host, Rishi, and to, to Ariel, and to Matt, and to Jay.